So I'm going to call on our last but not the least lecturer for this evening, um, Dr. Wu Peju. She's a PhD candidate. She's now the chief of the Division of Gynecology of the Department of OBGYN at Chung Shan Medical University Hospital, Taichung, Taiwan. And she's the Vice Secretary General of the Taiwan Association of Minimally Invasive Gynecology. I'd like to call on Professor Pei Ju Wu to the virtual floor to give a lecture on the application and benefits of fibrine sealant in ovarian surgery. Dr. Wu? Well, uh, thanks for the kindly introduction uh, from the, our uh, moderator. And I'm very happy to have a chance to give a talk over here. And I'm going to have a brief talk about the application and benefits of fibre seal in ovarian surgery. And first of all, I need to thank for Professor Lee to invite me to, to join this speech because uh, he's my very respected and mentor of my career. And today that after uh, Professor Chen's speech, we know that it's very difficult to uh, doing our surgery today, even only the ovarian surgery. And we need to consider about a lot of things. So today, this is my outline, and we're going to have a brief talk of over ovarian surgery. And but I know that everyone would be very familiar with this one. And then another question that we have conquered today is that how to preserve the ovarian reserve. So I'm going to to talk about and share about something about our surgical tips and uh, how to use the fibrin uh, sealant in our daily practice. And I'll give a small video sharing about our procedure and, and make a quick conclusion over my talk. And just like what we shared previously, that right now that there's so, a lot of obstacle in our daily practice. Uh, first, that it is a lot of uh, difficulties in our surgery, just like the bulky tumor or uh, more getting severely endometriosis that is not very uh, well controlled by medication. And we still need to go on to do the laparoscopic or even laparotomy surgery. And But we know we may be encounter a lot of adhesion, maybe over the bowels or deep infiltrated uh, endometriosis. And also that we get more patients that already received uh, repeated surgeries. So it will also let us to concern about the, when we do the surgery, maybe bowel adhesions or uh, bladder adhesions will need to be conquered during our procedure. And the most important part, just like uh, Professor Chen just mentioned about, that um, more and more patients that have getting married in their uh, advanced age. So the fertility preservation is a very important question for our patient. Uh, we're not just doing the right quality to remove all the ovary, but we need to concern about how to preserve their fertility, the ovarian reserve after our procedure. So uh, when we deal dealing with the uh, ovarian tumor, if those were non-endometrial ovarian tumor, I think that is not a big deal for every uh, surgeon right here. But when we are dealing with the endometriosis, endometrioma, we need to consider a lot of things. Uh, one is that uh, we just mentioned about that uh, maybe there's a lot of local inflammation that will cause fibrosis over the normal ovarian tissue and uh, our lesion. And another one is that maybe the patients they already have uh, impaired ovarian function. So there's a lot of debate about uh, should we do the surgery or not. Of course, the side effect of cystectomy have been reported. Uh, about the follicular depletion and while we're doing the surgery, maybe when we want to stop the bleeding, there will need to face about the thermal damage. So there's a lot of conservative management, just like aspiration, fenestration, ablation, or, uh, or the sclerotherapy. But we know that uh, uh, all the surgery or all the uh, treatment need to depend on the different uh, patient's condition, just like the customer rights for the, every patient, because that every uh, operant condition or every uh, size uh, of the page uh, of the cyst may be different for every uh, case. But if we re if we really still need to do the laparoscopic cystectomy. And, and or the medical treatment have been uh, found to be uh, valuable for these patients. We need to go on the surgery and we cannot just go get in and just drain out the, uh, the liquid. And how do we preserve the patients over in reserve during the procedure? So there's several uh, proposals have been um, made uh, in the literature. 
One is that uh, pre, how, how about giving some pre-operative hormone treatment uh, in selective cases? And the second one uh, would depend on the uh, surg surgical skill. Just like the Dr. Chen has mentioned, uh, we need to ask, uh, offer the patient uh, to the expert uh, endoscopist because the endoscopic now uh, can do the careful dissection during the whole procedure. And the most important part is not only careful dissection, uh, it's also important to avoid over coagulation or vaporization during the procedure. And in the end, uh, when to complete the surgery, uh, do we need to use suture or fiber sealant? Uh, this is the several steps that we can consider about uh, during our uh, procedure. Um, so further on, we are going to have a brief talk uh, over through these conditions. First of all is that do we need to give the um, some medication, some hormone treatment before our procedure. Uh, this is an old issue and have several proposal and some literature report. Although the uh, clinical data is, uh, the clinical cases is very limited, but um, uh, at, at 2007, there, uh, the Professor Donace had proposed that they do a three-step management. The patient will receive the laparoscopic uh, at the first time um, and do the ovarian drainage first and only make the clinical diagnosis, then they do nothing on the ovary and will give the patient with the uh, uh, buprenorphine or the GnRH and therapy for three months. And after three months, uh, they will go on the second look, laparoscopic surgery. And at that time, they do the vaporization. And another group is doing the cystectomy directly. And they found that this there seems to have some benefit through the combined approach, that, which means the hormone therapy followed by the surgery. And also in 2010, uh, there's the, on the fertility austerity, there's another group, but still a very um, limited uh, clinical case numbers. They show that there seems to have some benefit over their three-stage management, just like mentioned before, because they see that in the control group that who goes on the one-step surgery, uh, stripping of the tumor directly, uh, the AMA, AMH seems to be significantly decreased during the follow-up. And in, uh, in, 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 the, in the study group, the three-step group, it seems that their MH level is not so uh, damaged through this approach. So in their condition, they think that maybe the hormone treatment uh, in selected cases may decrease the local inflammation and let the surgeon during the surgery can uh, avoid a more stripping of the normal cortex. And there's another uh, study from the Japan group that is reported in 2021. And uh, they think that uh, it's a very similar uh, study design. They think that uh, uh, they do the three steps uh, as well, but the hormone treatment, they shift to the dynogest, uh, which we know uh, is a, a progesterone medication uh, that will have some benefit on controlling the inflammation effect over the endometriosis. And interesting that they found that uh, in both groups after the operation, uh, three to six months, uh, in both groups, they see there is the uh, decreasing level of the AMH. Uh, but uh, in, the, uh, in the study group in which used the dianogest as the open treatment, they found that after nine to 12 months, there is a recovery from the nadir in this group. So they think that maybe that the uh, using the hormone treatment may have the benefit uh, over uh, or have some protective effects uh, if we cannot avoid the, the surgery. And but the most important or most interesting part, I think, is the which that uh, Professor Kitajima have shared uh, in his uh, share. Uh, they, they, she, uh, he found that or uh, conducted in some uh, uh, studies. Uh, he, he found that uh, actually the MH level we know is varied in different patients. The condition over uh, that, that which will affect the MH level may be related to the age, the environment, or even the patient have the uh, disease just like endometriosis or not. And um, if the, we give in the patient with the surgery, maybe there will have some surgical damage to the normal cortex, even we have really believe on our technique because the lesions or the adhesion condition or the 
uh, thermal damage is not complete, is, it cannot be completely avoided during the operation. And there will be some atresia of the globe growing follicle after the surgical, because there will be a surgical stress. But if the patients have a, a, a better uh, baseline at the first of the, at the, before the operation, they found that they will have some enhanced recruitment after uh, the surgery because the low image may have some recruitment over it. And also that uh, if the baby patient have the better uh, baseline data, even after the surgery, there will, after the long-term follow-up, maybe there are some reconstruction uh, during the, uh, the follow-up. So it seems that there's a lot of uh, effect or a lot of uh, condition that will affect our uh, ovarian reserve during the operation. But it seems that for now that we, it's not possible we, to change the patient's age, the patient's environment, or to change the disease. But maybe we can have some um, method to control our surgical damage to the normal ovarian function. So we'll be on to talk about the surgical tips. We know um, and that uh, it's the major points to how to avoid damage to the ovarian cortex. And first of all, we know that it's, uh, the important part is to be have very careful sex section, uh, especially over the normal ovarian cortex and the vessels, uh, especially uh, uh, cl close to the hilum. And because the, that's the major part to, uh, to the blood supplies uh, to the ovary. And some propose that we can give some diluted vasopressing or hydrodexection to make us to make sure that or more clearly seen the uh, boundary or the uh, dissection uh, site for our operation. And also we can consider to use the um, to use the graspers just like the traumatic graspers and to ask our assistant to give us a more uh, balanced traction over the uh, normal tissue and the lesion and to make us to uh, clearly see the boundary and to preserve or avoid over, over stripping of the uh, normal ovarian cortex. And the most important part is that we need to avoid overcook or over coagulation uh, of our uh, ovarian tissue. Actually, when we do the uh, layer, uh, to see the layer more clearly during our dexition there, we can avoid uh, just like uh, breaking into the ball vessels. But uh, we know that in endometriosis, uh, endometriosis surgeries, it's not very easy for this part because the local inflammation will make a lot of new blood vessels uh, during the uh, boundary of the normal tissue and the lesion. So still we need to have some, do some coagulation, but uh, in my way, I will use the uh, suction irrigation to uh, irrigate the, uh, the, the coagulated part and to make sure, one to is make sure to, to have a very uh, careful hemostasis over the, the base of the normal blood cortex. So we all know that there is a, a lot of effect over the electrocautery on the open reserve and um, we see that the, uh, if we use the cautery and uh, compare with the uh, shooter, there will have a significant in increase of the serum epithelial chain, decrease of energy in the bipolar group. So um, traditionally we have proposed Propose that maybe you can use the suture method in, instead of the over coagulation. Uh, but some have talked about and have uh, developed some study. They found that uh, even we use the suture, but uh, it's, it's possible to uh, arrive around some ischemic change and adhesion formation because we're still using some foreign body to our body. And this kind of condition made uh, due to the suture material and may have uh, another. Uh, damage to the ovarian function. So uh, sealant material have been uh, proposed uh, in nowadays and because that uh, a lot of different uh, products have been proposed, but the basic, con uh, basic concept is that using this kind of product, uh, we still need to do the hemostasis, but we don't need to have do it diffusely. And we can use this kind of products to enhance hemostasis and which will further improve wound healing during our procedure. So I'll have some focus talk about the T cell, and that's what, what, what we're going to talk about the fibrin sealant today. And the composition and mechanism action, I think that uh, maybe most of the doctors will be very familiar with this one. So I'll have a brief 
uh, talk about it. Uh, it got two components. One is uh, as from being solution and another one is fibrinogen complex. And when, we, when the two components have mixed uh, during our operation, it just mimic our clotting pathway during, uh, just like our uh, body, human body. And that will uh, form fibrin clot and the fibrin clot will stop the bleeding and also that uh, will enhance our healing. But in a normal uh, human uh, body, the plasma will come in and will degrade the fibrin clot and will just uh, resolute it during uh, the uh, after days. But uh, for the this product, we have eight uh, acrotinin in in this product, which will effectively delay the degradation of the fibrin clot and will further enhance the tissue repairment uh, through this product. So there's four major functions for this product T-cell, which one is to achieve the hemostasis and will have the benefit to seal the wound and it can, can uh, gluing, have tissue gluing just attach the two surfaces together and which will just like a bridge over it and will support the wound healing during the whole procedure. And the most um, interesting part is that uh, this component tissue T cell will support uh, wound healing, just mimicking that our uh, human body does, does because that it creates fibrin clot just in, um, like mimics the natural physiological clot. So it will have a very good biocompatibility. And we know that when we uh, have the good bridge over here, just like a scaffold, and we can have the better uh, cell proliferation and angiogenesis through, through this process and bring um, more uh, or better nutrition inside to the wound and which will in the end that will enhance the wound healing. So um, today the, the, the product have two kinds of uh, applying method. One is topically and one is spray. And uh, topically is the most uh, or the more frequent way that I will use. And it, it has different applicator for laparoscopic or laparotomy surgery. You can just choose as you wish. And for me, that I have a brief sharing about how I do uh, during the operating surgery. I use the dual spray system. And the first step that we need to dry the site. And because if the bleeding is very actively, it's not uh, very easy to let the product stay on wood. And the second part is we need to apply the solution very slowly, just like dripping. I'll show you everyone uh, later. And the third part is that we need to have the, uh, to approximate our open cortex and have a slightly compression over it. And the most important part is that we need to allow it to uh, stay at the wind at least two to three, min three minutes. And after that, that will have, uh, they can achieve the sufficient polymerization. Then we will see that the uh, color of the uh, product will uh, from the transparent and, and getting into a little bit turbid and that was just like a gel uh, that we, we know uh, from in our uh, procedure. And uh, that's how, how I do in uh, in our daily ovarian uh, surgery now. Uh, not not in only in the endometriosis, even just like this, again, the case has a, a bilateral teratoma. And uh, especially in young women, I would suggest them to use this kind of product. Uh, we can just apply it over the wound and after uh, have some uh, compression, uh, someone can just say that just like making the Chinese dumpling over it. We can make the approximation of the wound of the ovary very, uh, very good. And I would like to have a brief sharing about the video. Uh, I in this video I have already complete the inclusion of the tumor. Uh, I used two hand surgery, and I tried to put the fibrocellum from the upper part a little bit just dribbling, uh, flowing down because of the gravity will just like the fluid going down, and you can see that there is some part getting a little bit uh, not so transparent. Um, I using the product as uh, use the two mini liter. There is still uh, another larger one. 
and I won't use it all in the first time. Uh, maybe only two thirds of it. And I will use my grasp curve to approximate. Apply some pressure over it. You can see that the product become a little bit sticky over it. And I will try to make the edge to be put together <coughs> as much as possible. And also we can found that there's no active bleeding flushing out. Uh, that's a better condition that when we apply the product, if the bleeding is very actively, it's possible that we just flush out all the gel. And maybe after two minutes, I will apply the rest of the product on the edge of the wound that we initially made to do the inoculation. <coughs> Sorry, because in my opinion, I think that um, as, as long as that we can make the, uh, there is less rough surface over the ovary, that uh, is the less possibility that we'll get adhesion. But we need to know that this product is uh, for, uh, is majorly to 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 enhance the hemostasis and healing. So it's not completely can be treated like as a uh, uh, an anti adhesion product. So in some cases, and maybe I'll try to use another kind of uh, product to avoid uh, adhesion during our procedure. So in the end, uh, we can see um, most part would well stick and approximate it together. So we will let ovary in, in place and maybe we'll put on another uh, anti-location product for it. So uh, there's also um, some study about the effect of the T cell. Uh, they put uh, 82 patient and 62 patient will go on the T cell with dextrin and another 20 patient just don't go on the dextrin only. And they do the second laparoscopic and found that for those with T cell, that the ovarian culture is uh, without any uh, adhesion, but in the control group that there is some adhesion observed in the uh, patients. Also that we know that for uh, these days, uh, some, uh, uh, some surgeons or even me will try to do the transvaginal uh, surgery, uh, what we call about not surgery. And sometimes when we do the not surgery, it's not very easily to use uh, suture uh, material or suture method to close the ovary uh, remain cortex because the uh, limitation of the uh, surgical space. So it's very you know, easy to use uh, T-cell or use this kind of fibrin to uh, help us to close the ovary wound. Uh, just like uh, this is the paper that being uh, proposed by uh, Chonggen group that they use the human fibrin glue to uh, close the over in uh, cortex uh, after uh, not, not surgery. And you can see that they use the uh, homemade, homemade hand port and uh, after it removed or inoculated the ovarian tumor, just apply the uh, B-cell over the cortex. You can approximate it very easily and you can have a very good result uh, to after the procedure. Uh, also, I need to mention that uh, uh, because uh, we today our talk, topic is main, 
uh, focus on the fertility uh, preserve uh, upser, uh, operation. Uh, the T cells application is not only on um, brain surgery, uh, we can also use it over the myomectomy or hysterectomy or even other kind of surgery, just like a fallopian tube surgery. But I think that the uh, most um, uh, effect may be related to the ovarian function. So the other part of the, uh, the application, I will let uh, uh, maybe everyone can have a further discussion over it. So that's my conclusion and my brief take home message. Uh, for now, that we know that the presence of endometrial per se may be the cause of a dimin diminished ovarian reserve. And Professor Chen has given us a brilliant talk about uh, to do or not to do the operation or the or hormone treatment for a different kind of condition. And sometimes we still need to do the surgical management and maybe maybe we need to have some modification of our procedure. And that's more and it's very important to protect our patient's ovarian reserve. And fibrocellin is very safe and effective product to improve the surgical outcome. And maybe uh, everyone or uh, every surgeon can consider about it uh, to improve the surgical condition and improve our fertility outcome for our patient. And that will be our talk today. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wu for a very interesting um, lecture. We have some questions here for our open forum. Uh, for the first question, um, could you please describe hydrodissection in cystectomy? Okay. Oh, uh, actually, that for me, I doesn't always do the <laughs> hydrodissection. Hydrodissection. Some will mm -hmm. just use the nose line, or some will add some tracing. And that, that's the more, uh, more important part is to see the layer. Uh, I don't usually do the injection, but sometimes I will use mm -hmm. the suction irrigation when we have the tension mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. normal to tissue and the lesion part. And I will use the mm -hmm. suction irrigation to wash the interface and the, the, the fluid will find the space and have the, some gradual dissection over it. But some will offer another uh, method, just like what I mentioned about it, use the injection way to injection mm -hmm. into just like what we do during the myomectomy but usually i will use the uh, irrigation part yep. to mm -hmm. the, uh, the, uh, the interface of the lesion and the cord. yeah mm -hmm. um the other question is in women who had the enoges before undergoing cystectomy will it not make it more difficult to separate the cis wall from the ovarian cortex well, uh, maybe other experts will have more opinion. I have several patients that will, usually I don't use diagonal jet to do uh, to every patient that will going on to the surgery because I think it's yeah. not a routine um, to, or more obvious benefit. But I do have some patients, maybe they, uh, depending on their uh, plan, they uh, take the medication first and maybe have the uh, surgery two or six months after the medication. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I think that will make the uh, operation easier. But since we didn't do the second look, <laughs> we're, not, we're doing the first operation for the patient. So because yeah. I think that the benefit of dental jets is to uh, diminish the angiogenesis and less local inflammation. So I think that the mm -hmm. easy to do the operation after medication, but I doesn't suggest to use it to every patient that we're trying to. Mm -hmm. Not to use it routinely, preoperatively. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is another question. Can we use the T-cell for a giant endometrioma? And is there any limit in size when we can use it? I noticed in your in your video that there was no suturing or no coagulation. It was just really the T-cell. Yeah. Yes, um, but I need to say that because uh, some tumor, I think uh, for endometriosis, maybe it's uh, 10 centimeter will be large enough. Uh, we have uh, treated some case just like uh, mucinous adenoma, maybe it will be bigger, even 18 uh, centimeter. Uh, I think that the application is not limited by the size uh, because you can use more product, just like the big, larger um, size of it. <laughs> That would be more happier for the for the small <laughs> size. <laughs> but uh, actually, if you are worried about the uh, the hemostasis condition, it cannot be covered by the product only. Personally, I would suggest maybe we can use some uh, absorbable suture. But 
uh, just like the conjoint of the two method, the suture method and the fiber sealant method. We, we, we don't need to limit ourselves to only one method. But for the video I share, because the lesion lesion size is not very big, so I use the fiber mm -hmm. sealant only. Yeah, only. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, you also mentioned um, during the video that you also use other anti-adhesives, and that's the next question. How do you use which type of anti-adhesive? To use well, for a particular case, yeah. Well, I think that because maybe now they will have more than five or ten kinds of product, even in different countries. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, that for different kinds of lesion, just like myomectomy or uh, hysterectomy or cystectomy, I think different product have different benefit. Just like maybe some fluid like or some um, uh, yellow paper, just like the. Uh, Barrier like, or uh, some will just like the uh, just like uh, different kind of product, just like intercy yeah. or ciprofen. Yeah. Each product has their benefit, and we need to choose uh, depends on our experience or our personal uh, our surgeons' uh, the, the usefulness for it. Uh, for me, then maybe I would depends on the, the size. If the uh, lesion size very diffusely, just like a lot of adhesion uh, over the uterus and the kudasa, maybe I'll try to use adapt uh, with kind of fluid like uh, mm -hmm. adhesion to overall coverage the whole pelvic area. Okay. And mm -hmm. so that's why I mentioned want to mention is that the T cell is not an anti LTC product. So if you're worried about it and you can try to join another kind of product to assist your surgical outcome. Yeah. And um, so when we were watching your video, we could see that, you know, it can spill outside the area of application. So I guess the next question is Is there any addition effect to other organs when you use the sealant and how do you avoid it? Yeah, that's a very important question. And some uh, doctor have been uh, making this kind of proposed that because we know that fiber, fibrin will make some fibrin clot. So fibrin clot may arouse some local inflammation. But uh, for me, after the surgery, I'll have to thoroughly irrigation over the site. And of mm -hmm. course, when, when we apply it, I will try to uh, let the uh, fluid dripping out very, as slowly as possible. So sometimes when you a little bit spill it out, will more like a gel like, yeah. and you can attach yeah. it over to the ovarian cortex, not just spreading mm -hmm. all over it. And actually, the, the amount is not so huge, so it's not possible you can split split it all over. But yeah, but if you worry, you can maybe you can just tear it off. Uh, if you it's attached to the uterus, you can you can just fold it down and over the uterus. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. So um. There's a last question for you. Um, it's a, thank you for your discussion. How do you rule out cancer preoperatively in your cases of endometriosis? Well, that's a big question. So <laughs> I think then no one can answer <laughs> the question yeah. well. But, uh, but basically, we need to depend on the imaging, just like uh, sonography, or even you need to do other kinds, just like CT, MRI. But we know that not, nothing can um, can can. can can be 100% uh, they rule out before the operation. So uh, maybe CA125 can be another uh, factor to help us or other signs like uh, the patient have ascites or other mm -hmm. uh, signs to alert us or any other solid part uh, in the tumor. But I think that the uh, most important part that we need to do the surgery uh, very carefully and um, maybe can we, if we can, we can avoid a splitage of the content and to do the end block uh -huh. surgery. If we were highly suspect about the malignancy, we need to um, to have the consultation with the patient. Maybe we need we we should not do the fertility preserving. We should not do the cystectomy. Yep. We can do the rectum uh -huh. and we can put the specimen in bag and do the frozen section uh, during our operation and to see if we seem to further going on to the uh, cancer surgery. Yeah, I agree. Before we consider conservative surgery, we should be very sure that, that we're not dealing with cancer. So thank you so much again, Dr. Wu, for that very interesting discussion.